Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I'm super happy to have Juan Calderon Bustillo with us today. Hey, Juan. Hey, how are you? I am doing well on this June 2nd of 2021 in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, we're going to start heating up real well today. We'll probably get up to Let's see, do, do, do. we'll probably get up to about 38, 39C today. So um, where are you located at, one? I'm right now in Santiago de Compostela. This is a tiny town in the northwest of Spain. And uh, we're about to start summer, but the summer here is relative. I mean, you never know what kind of weather you're going to get. So <laughs> we're working on it. OK. Uh, you have the honor of being the first person to do one of these author series with a mask. Awesome. Yeah, uh, we still the, have to. We all it. haven't been wearing them, but um, you're the first one to do with a mask. Yeah, I, I guess I can I can uh, motivate people to actually use it because I mean, it, it, lots of people tend to think it's useless. Uh, I think it's not. No, I, anyway, we have to use it. So okay. here I am. Very cool. Very cool. That's a pretty awesome shirt you got there on uh, the, the the title of your your t-shirt. Stolen today. from my brother. Yeah. Oh. I forget what it says. Uh, the, the mask. Oh, wow. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> is your brother older or younger than you? He's younger, six years younger. Yeah, okay. Very cool. Yep. But we use the same size. <laughs> yeah, little little brothers tend to be bigger like that. So indeed. Very, very cool. So Juan, what do you like to do for research? So uh, my research focuses uh, mostly on, on detecting gravitational waves from uh, any kind of source, mainly uh, mergers of, of binary, so of black holes or uh, neutron stars. I focus more on, on the black hole scenario. Uh -huh. And uh, in particular, I, I, I look forward to detect like very massive black hole uh, collisions because for these cases, uh, the emission that comes from the final object that forms, that is a kind of distorted black uh, mess before it actually is a black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, this emission is very strong within our current uh, gravitational wave detectors. So yeah. if we find one of those, that means we can start to test in quite uh, some detail uh, how gravity and general relativity work mm -hmm. uh, when the curvature of space-time is, is very, 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 very high. Uh, and also, if for some reason these objects were not black holes, but something that can mimic them, like for instance, uh, boson stars, uh, this is a, a good kind of scenario to, to try to find evidence for, for that extra physics that boson stars would give us. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my main focus. Uh, but from time to time, I, I find uh, some time to work on other problems related to mostly binary neutron star mergers, like uh, measurements of the Hubble constant, uh -huh. which is what I guess will we'll drive all of this discussion. We will. And in fact, <clears throat> that will bring us to this very lovely APJ letter article on mapping the universe expansion, enabling percent level measurements of the Hubble constant with a single binary neutron star merger detection. And Juan, take us away. Okay, so this is actually the, the, the first paper I, I do on this kind of topic, but it's very related to, to the kind of work I, I do with binary black holes. So, so one of the, of the nice things of, of black holes, uh, or of, one of the bad things of black holes, let's start by that, uh, is that it's very difficult to actually measure the distance at which these, these black hole collisions happen. And essentially, uh, this is because uh, once we get a signal, it's very difficult to distinguish the effect of how far the source is from the effect of how inclined the system is because both, both, both properties basically affect the, the amplitude of the signal. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a, farther, a, a, a far away signal is gonna be weak. A, a signal from a closer distance is gonna be strong, but also a signal from a, from a system that we see from the top of the, of the orbit is gonna be strong a signal that we observe from the actual orbital plane is going to be weak. Right. So these two things are degenerate. So usually when you see a signal and you kind of identify the masses of the source and all of that, you then have essentially two options. Either it is very far away and face on, or it's really close and we are on the orbital plane of, of the source. Right. 
So because of that, it's very difficult to, to infer the distance. Now, um, this is not true for all black holes or for all black hole collisions. When the black hole collision is kind of asymmetric, so let's say uh, one black hole is three times the mass of the other okay. or has three times the mass of the other, then you have a full collection of gravitational waves coming out of the of the source that we can call uh, or that we usually call gravitational wave modes. So it's a, you, you can imagine an orchestra where you have several instruments. Uh, when the two masses are equal, basically one instrument is the only one that plays. When you have an equal masses, you have lots of instruments playing. And uh, which instruments you can you can detect depends on where you are around the, the, the system. So when you are face on on the top, you will only see this dominant gravitational wave mode that we usually, uh, that, the one that we always say uh, that its frequency goes as twice the orbital frequency. So we, we only see this uh, face on. Right. But when, when you approach these equatorial positions, you start to see other gravitational wave modes. So detecting those tells you that the system is a John, and then you can detach that effect from that of the distance. Cool. So for asymmetric uh, black hole mergers, uh, it's easier to measure this distance. So then what about the, the neutron stars? So um, there is a thing I didn't say. Uh, on top of, of the two black holes being asymmetric, you want them to be quite massive. Because these extra harmonics or these extra instruments get activated uh, right when the two black holes collide. And this kind of emission is, is only uh, observable when the two black holes are quite massive. So the problem then comes for uh, binary neutron stars. Binary neutron stars are quite light. They, they are around, uh, let's say, below two solar masses when our black holes are usually in the 30s. Right. And uh, therefore, uh, we, will not, we, we cannot observe the two uh, stars colliding yet. Yet. We, we, need a, we need future detectors that can detect uh, gravitational waves in the kilohertz mm -hmm. to be able to observe that, the merger of the two. So then the question is, uh, okay, um, with uh, gravitational, sorry, with um, neutron stars, uh, we want to do, or in principle, we can do a new type of, of cosmology studies, which is uh, to obtain a, a, an independent measurement of, of the Hubble constant with respect to, to previous measurements. And this is because of the following. Uh, so the Hubble constant is, is measuring the, the rate at which the universe is expanding. So it essentially relates how fast the sources are re receding from us, so how fast they are moving, um, as a function of the distance. Um, so if you want to, to measure these Hubble constant parameters, you need to measure the velocity of the source and the, the distance of the source. Uh, there we go. OK. Yep. So uh, now that we can observe for some events like uh, our binary neutron stars, both uh, gravitational waves and electromagnetic emission, uh, the gravitational waves can independently tell us the distance with all of its uh, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, estimate the velocity uh, at which the, the source is moving uh, from the redshift. Okay, so with these two measurements, we can infer the Hubble constant. Our uh, gravitational wave uh, measurements or detections are not super loud right now. So our estimates are gonna be quite uncertain. So we, we talk about this current uncertainty of 15% in, in the measurement of the Hubble constant, which is much larger than other existing measurements. Right. Um, and on top of the, of the intensity itself of the signal not being too high, although this is the, the strongest we've got ever, uh, there is this problem with measuring the distance. I mean, you can you have a fundamental limitation in measuring the distance because you can not quite detach it from the from the effect of the inclination. So then the question is: uh, Imagine an, a scenario uh, where we can observe the actual uh, merger of these two objects. Okay. Of the two of the two uh, neutron stars, and uh, imagine that uh, these extra harmonics, these extra gravitational wave modes, are visible by our detectors. So then can we actually exploit this to measure uh, the inclination much better and therefore measure the distance better and refine the measurement of the Hubble constant? Yep. Okay. So this was the, the, the main motivation of this study. Um, then some surprises appeared. So um, if we go to, to figure one, we, we can start to see uh, what I'm talking about. So, okay, this is figure one. And uh, on the left, 
uh, you can see the, the gravitational wave modes of uh, the collision of two neutron stars. Okay. Okay. If there is a, let's say, there is a late in spiral part, which is this, this early portion in which you see a small, sorry, slow increase of the amplitude. Uh -huh. And then right, right by the peak, the two neutron stars merge. They form a kind of hypermassive neutron star. Uh -huh. This hypermassive neutron star is emitting gravitational waves for a long time. In this case, uh, something like uh, 70 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And then it actually collapses to a black hole and the emission ends. Yes. So uh, here you can see the, the, the modes that are being emitted. Uh -huh. First, there is the, what we call the, the quadruple mode, the one that dominates the whole story, which yeah. is the one in blue. Yeah, two, two. Mm -hmm. And this is the one, uh, this is the only one we would see uh, if we are on the top of the source. So again, on the, the top of the source means uh, that the orbital plane happens here and we are just uh, on mm -hmm. top of it. Yep. Um, but agree. then there are some tiny, tiny um, uh, subdominant modes or higher harmonics yeah. that actually have some contribution uh, if we observe the source uh, from the edge, edge on. They are very tiny, but they may help us to do something. Uh -huh. So if you go to the right, you can actually see how these different modes contribute depending on, on where we are around the signal. Okay. Now, you don't see, you don't see a, 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 the signal as a function of the time here. You see it as a function of the, of the frequency content, but in practice, uh, you can imagine that the time is flowing towards the right. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. yep. So uh, the blue one is a signal uh, you see phase on. Mm -hmm. which in principle is a combination of, of all of those modes, okay? Mm -hmm. But in practice, it's, it's only the, the blue one you saw on the left. That's why we are also depicted in blue. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, if, we, if you look at the signal viewed from, from the edge, edge on, the green one, yes. you see uh, it's slightly different. And in particular, it has this kind of glitch at uh, half the plot. Uh, right where it, So there is a region where it's coinciding with a kind of red mountain. Uh-huh, yep. So it's around, I would say, 1500 hertz or something like that. Right in the middle of the plot, there is a kind um, of glitch in the green curve. There we go. Yep. But that actually, that actually is coming from these extra higher harmonics that are combining with the, with the blue one. And actually, uh, this is essentially what we call the 2-1 the, the, the harmonic that goes as one time the, the orbital frequency that is just interacting with your, uh, your, the other harmonic in some way. Is the LMI. Um, okay. and, and the way to, to know that is that essentially, if you look at the amplitude of that mode, which is peaking exactly at that frequency, the red one, mm -hmm. yep. that, that's basically the only thing that's alive in there on top of the, of the blue mode. So, so this glitch is essentially produced by, by the red mode. Cool. Interesting. So this is, a, and this is above the, the noise curve of, the, of this detector that we are considering, which is in black. Okay, so that means that that thing should be observable okay. or, or, or should have some kind of effect. Of course, this, this noise curve does not correspond to a current detector mm -hmm. because current detectors basically die at, uh, let's say, 500, 700 hertz. Mm -hmm. This is a, a projected detector um, uh, that, that is planned to be built in Australia. It's called NEMO. So this is a planned detector whose goal is to essentially uh, observe or be able to observe the, the post-merger of these uh, um, binary neutron stars. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, uh, the reason why uh, this kind of uh, extra harmonics are rising, are rising here is because of the, the, the two neutron stars merge. So you can imagine that this stuff is gonna get a bit asymmetric and that this is what triggers all of these extra yeah. uh, emission modes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this depends a lot on, on what's going on within the stars, namely what's the equation of state of, of, of the neutron matter inside those stars, yes. which is a, one of the big questions this detector wants to answer. In our case, we will not care about measuring these, these properties. We will just like, exploit them, assuming we know them. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, okay. given all of this uh, stuff, then we want to understand if uh, we can identify the inclination of the signal based on what kind of, sorry, of the source, based on what kind of signal we observe from it. Okay. So to that, uh, one can go to, to figure two to see, uh, or to get an idea of what's gonna happen. Cool. 
probabilities and figure two. Let's blow that up a little bit. And... Yeah. So this is the one. Okay. Now this figure is a bit tricky, or mm -hmm. the whole problem was a bit tricky. So um, this uh, signals from the post merger of, or from the final stages of these neutron star collisions. Uh, as of now, are obtained by uh, numerically numerically simulating the systems in a supercomputer, and that takes a lot uh, a lot of time. Mm -hmm. yep. So, because of that, uh, we can only simulate the last few stages of of that uh, neutron star collision, namely the last few orbits, the merger, and the in the post merger. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But uh, in reality, uh, these signals are going to be observed by a, uh, during a couple of minutes. So, the the, the in spiral process. Mm -hmm. That comes before the merger can be observed uh, during two three minutes with with these new detectors. Cool. So that means that we only if if we did our study based only on the post merger signal, we would be underestimating by a lot the actual loudness of the signal, and therefore our estimates of what can and what cannot be done would be really uh, really poor and really unrealistic. Yeah. So how does one go about it? <laughs> so ideally, one would compute in some way. A, a signal or a waveform model, signal model that covers the, all the inspired, sorry, all the orbits that you can observe plus this final stage that we simulate with supercomputers. Yep. Uh, so we actually tried that and constructed some of those signals. Cool. The problem is that uh, when you want to try or you, when you want to test whether you can measure something or not, you do the following experiment. You, you get the signal you are try, gonna try to measure, let's say the one emitted phase on, Mm -hmm. You put it into the detector noise, so you bury it into the detector noise, and then you compare it with many, 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 many models for different orientations, distances, even different masses of the source, even different spins. Mm -hmm. And you look at, uh, well, once you've done this comparison, you, you kind of have a sense of with what other systems uh, the one you actually considered can be confused. So in other words, you, you come up with a, with a measurement of your distance, your inclination, your masses, whatever. The problem is that this process involves the comparison in principle with hundreds of thousands of, of signal models. Yeah. But these are very uh, expensive to generate. If you follow this strategy of, of, of just uh, trying to combine your uh, signal, so your signal model for the in spiral with our numerical simulations. Mm -hmm. So we took an alternative, an alternative approach. Okay. We said, okay, uh, let's do two experiments here. First, uh, the blue and the red. Okay. And in this case, uh, instead of having two neutron stars, we're gonna say, okay, let's consider we have two black holes merging okay. that just have the same masses as the neutron stars. Okay. So. It, 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 it's the same all the way except for the merger. The only difference between the two systems would happen at merger, which is when the you can realize that the, in, in, in one system there is matter and in the other there is vacuum, which is just a black hole. Right. But for the most of the story, this, this is okay. So um, we did these two experiments in which we, in this case, inject or take a reference signal that is from a phason system, which okay. would correspond to the point, so to the uh, left end of the plot at cos iota equals one, and located at a distance of 40 megaparsecs. Okay, all right. So the true, okay. I, think, I, think, I think I can paint here, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see, cosine theta equal one. So the, 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 the true values will be here. Okay. Oh, very good. And then you, and then you start to do this comparison with, with other models. So in the first case, you forget about these higher harmonics. And so you just do the standard comparison. Got it. And you get this blue contour for your estimates. Uh -huh. okay. okay. So this contour uh, gives you a range of possible distances and inclinations. Uh, on the left, uh, the plot on the left shows this for a case of, of equal masses. So the two black poles have the same masses and therefore these the extra harmonics are not going to be quite strong in this case. Right. That's why even if you let your analysis know that this harmonic should exist, the improvement you get, which is uh, given by the red contour, is not is not much. I mean, the red contour and the blue contour are, are, are quite the same. Right. So you do not improve much by, by exploiting all of this higher harmonic story. 
Okay. Okay. Yep. Then you go to the right where the masses are. Uh, so the mass ratio is 1.5. So one, okay. one of the black holes is 50% larger than the other. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the higher harmonics are going to be stronger because of this asymmetry that I mentioned before. And as you can see that the difference between the blue contour and the red contour is massive. It is pretty large. So yep. there, there is a reduction of the uncertainty uh, by a factor of three or four. Nice. Especially the, the one in the distance, the one in the, in the inclination. Uh -huh. So that means that uh, if these two were uh, neutron stars and you have an electromagnetic counterpart, okay. then you would have a much, much better estimate of the distance. And therefore, you may have a much, much better estimation of your Hubble constant. Yes, I'm with you. To combine your, your estimates, this estimate of the distance with another estimate of the uh, velocity of the source that, that's going to come from, from the telescopes. Yep. And in principle, you could get an improved uh, um, gotcha. Hubble constant measurement. Uh -huh. So this is, so this, this, this red and blue contours that I've discussed um, are neglecting the fact that during the post merger of those two neutron stars, there will be some extra stuff you could exploit because we are modeling the whole system as black holes, not neutron stars. Yes. So in order to try to guess what would happen with, with neutron stars, uh, we uh, okay. injected, so we took as, as reference the phason signal of those two neutron stars, but only the, the, the last bit. So the, the last few orbits and the post-merger. So it's, it's a really, really short signal uh -huh. as compared to, so this is 80 milliseconds as compared to the two minutes uh, we were playing with before. Okay. So again, um, uh, the, the, the improvement uh, in the left case, which is now uh, you need to compare, uh, you need to compare blue, okay, with either orange or green. Yep. The, the, the improvement with green is not, is not great, but is something. So this is telling you that 80 milliseconds of that signal help you more than the whole two minutes of the, of the signal without these higher harmonics. Right. Uh, for a given, this is for a given equation of state of the neutron stars. If you try another equation of state of the neutron stars, then these this higher modes are not so strong, and and, and you even you, you just lose information, uh, just because the signal is, is very weak. Okay. Nothing. And the same situation happens on the right for the unequal for the unequal masses. Just that the improvement, as before, is is much better. Yeah. Yep, yep. So the take home message here is, is twofold. Um, even if you have black holes, you can, you can use these uh, higher harmonics emitted during the, the whole in spiral process. So, so, so during this whole circular dance, which yep. are very weak, but last for two minutes and they will help you in, in one case a lot, in the, one, in the other case, not so much. But furthermore, if you were to uh, use the, 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 the higher harmonics of the post merger, you can improve this even more. Yes. So, so once, uh, once that one has the, this intuition that the distance improvement is, is, is there, one goes and look uh, what happens to the, to the Hubble constant. Okay. So I'm gonna erase my red from here, that's it. So I think if we go to figure three all the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, I John kisses, figure three, let's blow that up. Yeah, luminosity distances. Uh, sorry, figure four then. Figure four. H not. Yeah, exactly this thing. Um, so okay, I, I, this plot is, is a bit tricky at the beginning, but I, I'll try to go uh, about it. So let me again get my uh, annotating thing. Nobody's think, annotated before. I think this is awesome. Okay. I'm painting again. Now this is super useful. I, 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 the, the second author of this uh, paper, which by the way is a second year undergrad, uh, yeah. sh showed me this. This is awesome. You cannot un you cannot understate the, the 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 role of this of this student. This I mean, it's just a second year undergrad, but uh, yeah. it's incredible. Um, okay, so I would say uh, let's go first to the left because uh, I think it, sorry to the right plot. To the right. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a, it gives a clearer picture of what happens. Bigger, uh, bigger cube. Oh, but, but we'd better see the legend on the left, so. Okay, I will <laughs> put both up. Yeah, it's perfect, that's perfect. Okay, so what we do here is the following. Um, 
we uh, have this this signal from a from a putative phase on uh, either well in principle a, a binary neutron star located at 40 megaparsecs, and we have our distance estimate uh, from the top panels. So on the one hand we have the distance, and then we we are going to simulate or pretend that someone is giving us an estimate of the uh, velocity of this of the uh, of the source. Okay. which is uh, measured in terms of the redshift of the source. Mm -hmm. So because the, the source has a velocity with respect to us, the signal gets redshifted. Mm -hmm. um, so we are going to then uh, pretend that this redshift uh, has a given uh, uncertainty. So it, it's, it's, it's a statistical measurement that is centered at the true value that okay. the, the short should have. Um, Plus, uh, plus minus some uncertainty. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, so we go from uh, this value of 0 0.9 times 10 to the minus three in the in the uncertainty, which is a realistic value of nowadays. And then we go all crazy and let's say let's assume that telescopes improve and we can get I don't know so to to even this level. Yeah. So in all of this game, the uncertainty in the distance is is the same always. It's the one we got before. Yes. And then we assume different upgrades or technologies for whatever the telescope that is giving us this very, this redshift very cool mm -hmm. so then we combine the two things and we try to to estimate the value of the hubble constant so this is the line for the true value we're assuming which is i should know this number but i guess it's 67.4 the value we are assuming yes it's complicated to write with this, but anyway, I think I'm doing yeah, it. Yeah, because you're doing 67.4. <laughs> and then uh, we see what we obtain with our different statistics. So blue is an analysis in which we are uh, neglecting the fact that the source is emitting these higher harmonics. Okay. So you can see that the uh, median value we get is here for nowadays precision in the in, in the redshift measurements. Mm -hmm. And this is the uncertainty. Yeah. So uh, let's say the uncertainty is quite big and the measurement is almost biased. So the true value is, is on the edge of, of what we are allowing. Yes. Of, 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 of what our measurement thinks, let's, let's put it that way. So red, which you see here mixed with the green, um, is a case in which we actually know that these higher harmonics are gonna be there. And, and we use that fact. So that would correspond to our red measurements on figure two. Uh -huh. um, and here we are not adding the information about the uh, the fact that this is a binary neutron star with all of its fancy post mergers. We are okay. just assuming the, the black hole hypothesis. So uh, let, let's say level two in fanciness, not, not yet level three. Uh, so you can see now that we get uh, this new measurement for nowadays. Yes. Okay. So two things happen. Now the measurement is centered at the true value. That's one thing. And the other is that the uncertainty is, is quite lower than in the blue case. Definitely. So this is for nowadays, uh, let's say redshift or telescope technology. Now we start to upgrade telescopes towards the, the left of the plot uh -huh, so that the uncertainty in the redshift uh, reduces. So what's going to happen is that if, if, if you get a perfect measurement of the redshift, let's say on the left end, but your distance is biased, then the Hubble constant is going to be biased. Uh -huh. And this is what happens in the blue case where you don't take into account the higher harmonics. So you can see that the true value is basically on the end of, of mm -hmm. this blue distribution. Okay. Whereas if you take into account the, the higher harmonics, uh, you get a really nice measurement of the Hubble constant. Yeah. To actually, I tend to remember a two or three percent accuracy right. with a single source, mm -hmm. and and that's important. Uh, I will discuss it later. So this is for the case of ah, okay, and if we go to level three of being fancy, which is adding the extra information from the post merger, what you can see is that we don't gain much uh, with this with with respect to the case of not including it in this case. The reason is that uh, when you have a mass ratio of one point five, not not equal mass. Uh, the higher harmonics, despite uh, being weak, they are they are they are living there there and they are living for two minutes. So okay. two minutes of higher harmonics compared to eighty milliseconds. The eighty milliseconds do not give you extra. So that's why the green is not giving you any extra uh -huh. accuracy with, with respect to the red. 
Okay. However, in the Q, okay, mass ratio equals one case, so M1 or mass one equals mass two. Mm -hmm. yep. These higher harmonics are not really excited or are not really there during the spiral. Right. Or, I mean, most of them are zero. Some of them are there, but they are really weak. So in practice, let's say you have nothing. Uh, so that's why the, the improvement in this case uh, of the uh, red case with respect to the blue is there, yes. but it's not as spectacular as on the right. <coughs> yes. Uh, basically, again, because you don't have uh, so many or so so stronger harmonics or extra harmonics in this case. However, uh, now you can exploit the, the post merger. Now you include this information from the post merger. And just from those extra 80 milliseconds of signal, you get a nice improvement of green for green with respect to red. Indeed. So green is giving you let's say a, a measurement that is non-biased, I, I have to admit that the true values is still on the edge of our, uh, of our final measurement, but uh -huh. it's, it's okay, it's there. And that is much improved with respect to, to, to the other two. So the take home message is, these higher harmonics are gonna help you a lot. Mm -hmm. In the case of uh, unequal masses, uh, the, just using the, the information from the in-spiral process, it's good enough to, to get a, a, a quite a spectacular improvement in your distance estimates and therefore your Hubble constant estimate. Absolutely. If you are in the case of, of equal mass, um, in which these uh, harmonics uh, from the spiral are not so strong, you can still go and, and potentially use the, the information from the post merger mm -hmm. where these harmonics are actually triggered. Um, because of some fancy phenomenology that is called a, a, a uh, spiral one arm instability. This for me is just a name. I don't know the physics of it. So uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the take home message. Cool. Um, I was, uh, I, I said, I was gonna discuss something uh, in the middle of this discussion and I forgot, okay, yes. So in, in this case, as you can see that um, if, if telescopes improve enough uh, in the future, and you use uh, our strategy of using these higher harmonics, then you, get, you can get levels or precision levels of approximately 3%. Yep. Nice. Based on a single estimate, on a single uh, event on the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several uh, strategies proposed to achieve this kind of, of accuracy, but those assume uh, the observation of several signals so that you just uh, accumulate those observations in order to reduce your uncertainty. But that has the underlying assumption that the Hubble constant is a constant. That is gonna be the same for, for, for all, the, all the sources. Uh -huh. However, if you can get to this level of precision based on a single event or you know, a single observation, you can start to, to kind of map, map it out. what the Hubble constant is in each direction and tell if it's the same in, in, in all directions. So if the universe is uh, isotropic right. and also if it is the same at all distances. So if the Hubble constant has varied throughout the history of the universe. Um, so this is basically the, the summary of what we did. So cool. um, again, I wanna highlight a lot the, the, the role of, of our uh, undergrad student, uh, Samson. Um, he, he, we, together with him, we actually found an error in our first submission of, of this paper, <laughs> like one year ago. And, uh, and then he, he actually repeated most of the, of the analysis in, in the right way. And, um, and yeah, we got these, these fantastic results uh, that are now the, the, the final version. Very cool, very cool. Juan, I wanna thank you so much for uh, walking us through this really fascinating letter. That's just, just great. Um, let me ask you, so, so where do we go, uh, you know, as a community, let's say over, over the next five years or so, are there additional calculations to do? What sort of the time scale for maybe Nemo to come online and do something? Uh, of course, LIGO and Virgo will continue to do their thing, um, but just sort of give it, give it your future look over the next, let's say, half decade or so. Well, that's a, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh... Uh, my so personally, my 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 research plan or my expectations are not so much on the on the Hubble constant end or on the cosmology end, but more on the 
on the side of, of let's start to, to test uh, general relativity and gravity in detail uh, when, when two black holes collide and you have this, this black mess that is, that is formed. Mm -hmm. um, so in the future, uh, I think that one of the main things we, we may start to get is, is some new physics, some signatures of new physics, yeah. uh, namely uh, some effects of dark matter or some uh, effects of what's called uh, ultralight bosons that can form up these, these bosonic stars. And that may explain some of the one or one or, or some of the events uh, that we have seen already. And, uh, and and within known physics, start to observe like a uh, new phenomena, like for instance, uh, observing recoiling black holes. So when you when two black holes collide, uh, the remnant actually starts to to I mean gets kicked out because of the anisotropy of the emission. Uh, and this is quite important because it, 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 this recoil velocity can be so high that it can kick the black hole out from the galaxy. Okay. And therefore, that black hole has no chance of merging again. So it, it kind of stops the, the merging chain. Uh, in the end of the, oh, or in the topic of the, of the Hubble constant, one of the things I want to do um, is to see if, if we can uh, measure the Hubble constant without light. So just based on the on the gravitational web source itself, yeah, yeah. Uh, which would amount to observe that source actually moving away during the observation time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a project that I actually got another undergrad student is, is starting. Is, is, is I, I don't see the end of that project in the next five years, but let's see what we can do. And uh, nice. but yeah, I, I think the the main goal is to start to observe uh, sources we did not expect. Right. And hopefully uh, new physics within those. Okay. BSM. Very cool. Very nice. <clears throat> Juan, I want to thank you once again for walking us through this fascinating article. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.